The pressure on traditional banks and their business models is constantly growing. The challenges have the ability to innovate, a trait that income banks almost seem to have eliminated from their DNA. So what is holding the banks back? And what if there is a way to turn the tables? Hello, my name is Steffen Lenz, associate partner with Cuperia. Today, I would like to inspire some thoughts with you about how banks can develop a way into the future, even if we maybe don't know exactly what this might bring. Why can I talk about this? Well, I've been an executive with incumbent players like Credit Suisse and Finova, so I know where many of you currently are. Also, I held multiple CTO roles in fintechs, where among other things, we build a new core banking system and build a digital wealth management process. So I know this side of the business as well. Today, I would like to use this experience to develop a somewhat different perspective with you, a perspective on the bank of the future. To set the scene, we should be clear about what is changing around us. What we see are structural changes in a number of areas. First of all, the markets change by value chains breaking up, increasing the transparency on certain services and thus putting high pressure on the margins. And technology is enabling entirely new business models. Just think of peer-to-peer uh, -peer business where banks are eliminated as the intermediary. Second, we see a demographical change, and this is especially important for wealth management, where the average customer is aged 65 or even beyond. And last but not least, we see changes in the workforce. The younger people have a completely different idea of a work-life balance, and COVID-19 just proved that the way we do work can actually change in an instant. Now, what is the response of the income bands? What you can observe across the board are rearguard battles. Banks cut costs, expand old business models to new regions, or focus like everyone on ultra high networks where they hope for higher margins. The strategy seems to be to buy time and prepare for a future with a shrinking market. Every bank has a digitalization strategy aiming for optimization and maybe new offerings. There are things happening in the organization around agility, Scrum, and SAFE, for example, and there are technology initiatives trying to leverage machine learning, robotic process automation, and the like. So there's definitely happening a lot. Now, let me ask a nasty question. Will all this help? Is there a vision for the bank of the future? And will all these activities help to get there? Honestly, I have my doubts. And here's why. Let's start with strategy. Of course, you need a strategy in the sense how you want to respond to the changes around you. However, a strategy in the traditional sense, a plan that you make and then execute, comes from the old world. In the new world, change is the new normal. So we are not talking about a one-off transformation after which you're done. We are talking about developing new capabilities capabilities to constantly innovate, change, and adapt. When we talk about organization, also there the problem has been recognized. And there's a lot of talk about overcoming silos and implementing agile practices. One thing should be clear, however. Just implementing agile practices in the engine room of a tanker won't turn it into a race boat. There's much more to this. We'll talk about it in a minute. Third, let's talk about technology. Let's face it. Most application landscapes look more or less like this. Of course, the problem is understood and there are initiatives to decommission one or the other application or to carve out a service from a monolith. However, at the same time, stuff is added. Machine learning, workflow engines, robotic process automation. All this will add to the complexity of this picture and drive maintenance cost long term. What the bank of the future really needs is ultimate flexibility and truth of cost. And such a picture cannot deliver this. So the real question is not what technology you should make use of. The real question is 
how can you create a clean and efficient IT landscape. Let's talk about a vision for the bank of the future. When the bank of the future has to compete with innovative and efficient startups, established companies need to develop similar capabilities, at least to some extent. So let's look at how well-run startups operate and use this as a cheat sheet. First, they always start with business and derive anything in technology and organization what they need to deliver. Second, they build units around client value. They build cross-functional teams, no silos. Third, they use technology as an enabler and not as a support function or even a cost center. And last but not least, they outsource anything that is non-differentiating and non-core. Let's see why this is relevant. The key effect of the change in our industry is that more and more financial services become commoditized. We see this in retail with neobanks being the challenges. We see this in wealth management with the robo-advisors and we see this with mortgages where more and more the banks apply to the customer than the other way around. Now, being a commodity provider is not where you want to be because this is where the price is the only decision criteria for the client. So possible ways out of this are you either focus on a niche where you're specialized to a specific need and you're the first choice for your client, or you turn into a, a platform aiming to be a one-stop shop where the client sees an additional value that makes him pay the premium. Now, when we talk about platforms, this is exactly where we need to fear the tech giants. If you look at what Amazon, Facebook, Google, and the others are doing, they maybe are no experts in banking, but they know how to build platforms. Imagine an app store for wealth management services. No matter whether you choose a niche or aim to build a platform. The key characteristics that we look for in the bank of the future are ultimate flexibility, efficiency, and speed. You need to be able to launch new services quickly and cheaply, integrate third-party services fast, and do all of this to the delight of your clients and at very competitive cost. When we Double-click on a bank capable of such wonders, we see three elements. Client centricity, high performance and productivity, and a real consistency of business and IT. Let's dig into this in more detail. Customer centricity is more than a buzzword. And it's also not a claim that management can declare. And it's also not about inventing new ways how to melt the cow. Honestly, when I send a friend some money to share a restaurant bill, I do not think of buying an investment product or an endurance. Customer centricity is about putting the client at the beginning of the value chain. The client is not there to be convinced of the products and services that are being pushed to him, but the other way around, he is pulling what he's needing. And in banking, the keyword for this is personalization. Second, let's talk about performance. Productivity is calculated with this formula. And what traditional companies, banks or not, typically do is to, when they come under pressure, is to optimize the input part. This is known as cost cutting. But wait a second. The bank of the future needs to be innovative, flexible, and constantly adapt to change. That's a feature of the output part. So we need to think about how we in improve that. The organization is not only a cost factor, it's actually also a key to growth and do good business. Teams and organizations become high performing by turning them into cross-functional units with shared goals and incentives. Shared goals come with client centricity. And this is exactly how startups operate and you see why this is relevant also for the bank of the future. Third is about consistency of business and IT. Now, this is not about the worn-off 
term of IT business alignment with increased communication and some shared goals. There is much more to it and most importantly, a technical component. If you think of the application landscape, business is paying for a lot of baggage because this whole thing is much more expensive than it could be. What you need is a service landscape that basically provides plug and play functionality where you get new services at low cost and you get truth of cost so that you can offer these things at transparent and competitive prices. So this is what we need and then we are where the startups are. Okay, let's turn this into action. Number one, differentiation. We talked about developing your niche. Second, diversification. Building a platform is one option to do that. And the third point is your platform that decides about your overall capabilities and your productivity. Now, if we look at differentiation and diversification, this is a lot about leveraging opportunities by taking a closer look at your clients and thoroughly understanding your assets and your strengths. But wait a second. This is all nice and there's opportunity for growth and a shiny future. But if you want to do this in a sustainable way, there is some homework to do first. Remember this picture? This is the problem that you need to solve. This is the key to the flexibility that you need for new services. And it is the key to lower the cost for services in your current business. How can we solve this? The trick is not to take the usual technical or application-centric view. Take the startup's approach and start with business. Migrate one client-centric service after the other onto a new flexible platform and operate it in a new and efficient way. Think of a service as a venture with its own business case. So how does this work in detail? You start with a client service. For example, mortgages. How should the future client experience be when applying for a mortgage? Then you develop a future target operating model and a target architecture. How would you design and build this service if you wouldn't have a legacy? Then you look at external third party or fintech services that can amend the service for um, an enhanced client experience or can make it cheaper to operate. And only in a third step, you map it to your existing landscape and plan for a transition in small steps that ensure a quick return on investment and reduce the risk. Let's conclude with a few tangible things you can start doing tomorrow. And to motivate you, I would like to highlight something very important. There is actually no reason to fear fintechs and go on rare battles. The new opportunities are available to everyone. So turn your rare battles into a mission of exploring and exploiting the new opportunities. Let's touch on some tactics for you. When thinking in ventures, the first step is to identify opportunities. Take your client's perspective. Dig in the data to find out who your clients really are and where the money is. Do some design thinking to empathize with your clients. Get a market view on what's going on out there in the fintech world. What will the services maybe look like in three or five years from now? Combine ideas from inside and outside your organization to identify where a client needs underserved and where you have room for automation. And once you've identified the opportunities, you can start talking to fintechs and maybe test one or the other collaboration. You can start thinking about which services to carve out or rebuild. Or you can actually start a new venture with an entirely new business model. Obviously, such a mission is something fundamentally different than what your current organization is used to. So make sure you pick the right people that are able to support you in this mission, make an impact and really move the needle. It's not about strategy consultants, it's not about technology resources, it's not about agile methods, 
I think that that became clear. What you need are people who understand you, who share your vision of the bank of the future and who are able to shape it together with you. So I hope this inspired some thoughts about the bank of the future and possible ways to get there. There's much more that hasn't been said, but every journey starts with the first step. I thank you for listening and I look very much forward to continue the discussion in person. Thank you.